um, I would like to welcome you to this uh, webinar of Subit Chakrabarti. So I'm really happy that he's today our speaker uh, in the series uh, of uh, REACT and ERDF. So these are two of the technical committees of the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, uh, which are uh, where we have tried now to combine uh, both technical committee in order to enrich a little bit the topics that we have uh, in our portfolio to present this to the wider community. So that's uh, the main idea behind these webinars. Um, now we will have quite a lot of webinars in this in a, in a row, or let me say September, October, and November. Um, until end of November, and uh, we would like that you just follow them. So for what stands REACT, because my name is Arena Heinzek, and uh, I'm leading together with Subit, actually, uh, the new technical committee, which is called REACT, and REACT has quite a long name in terms of short abbreviation, but long name. And I just read it now. It just stands for Remote Sensing, Environment, Analysis, and Climate Technology. So that uh, stands for and is dealing actually with all topics related to climate change and also to the uh, sustainable development goals. So everything related to these and in combination with uh, remote sensing, these are the topics uh, where we'd like to exchange um, and uh, bring the people together uh, to work also together. So that's uh, the main idea of the technical committee of REACT. So Subit is today, uh, I would say, the third in the row. So we had in the beginning an introduction into React. And then we had um, the first, we, what we have in React, we have several smaller uh, topics uh, or local theme areas, let me say. The one theme area we have already displayed or we, we had a presentation on it from um, uh, from Avik Bhattiharya uh, uh, from India. So he was talking about uh, agricultural um, uh, area and also the, the problems in terms of agriculture and climate change. And today we will have a topic uh, which is related to, to flood inundation in Africa and everything related also. Uh, in principle, that's kind of a trigger of climate change too. Uh, so therefore, this is also a very important topic uh, that is uh, deal today. So our speaker today is, uh, as was already saying, is presenting is Subit Chakrabarti, probably just shortly to him. So Subit uh, actually is the director of uh, cloud to street So uh, he's managing engineers, but also scientists uh, in his domain. So that's very important. And the main goal actually of cloud to street is to produce high quality maps, uh, which are uh, presenting also uh, one of the products is here peak flat extent, uh, which is very relevant to any kind of needs, um, but also for disaster management, uh, for flat managers, but also for any kind of insurance. So that's an important uh, parameter which they are looking for. Um, his technical interest or and also expertise is um, into um, the development of novel spatial temporal machine learning methods. So that's his main, let me say, um, um, not only background, but also um, the main interest that he has. And um, yeah, just probably shortly, he, had a P he has a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Florida, uh, where also in his thesis, he was already dealing with the topic of machine learning based um, techniques, for example, um, using super resolution of microwave imagery for land surface and biophysical uh, methods. So this is um, his main interest. And um, I'm very, very, as I was already saying in the beginning, I'm very happy that he's today uh, giving us an insight into his main thematic area of, uh, which is one of the topic of React. And before we start, and I invite Subit um, to speak up, I would like um, yeah, that you all close, sorry, your, your microphone so that Subit will be not disturbed. So this would be great. If you like, you can let open your videos, uh, but for transmission, sometimes it's better if you close it, so up to you. But then later on, when we have uh, the questioning and answering session, which is at the end of Subit's presentation, you can all again 
uh, open up your video so that we can uh, see you and we can uh, hear your question or your comments um, and we can better communicate with each other. So, okay, so then I, I ask Subit to start his uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Irina. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Subit Chakrabarti, like Irina said, and um, I work in flood inundation monitoring. And um, there is a lot to say here, and we only have maybe like 50 more minutes and I have uh, 62 slides. So uh, in case that I'm not able to finish it all, um, you know, maybe like send me an email, send me a DM on Twitter and we can talk some more if you're interested. Um, also, if, if you are able to, please consider turning on your video so that I can kind of see some faces on the screen. I think um, that's, uh, that's great as a as a presenter. So, uh, but obviously, like no, uh, you don't need to do that if you're not able to. So today we are going to talk about near real time monitoring of uh, flood inundation, and uh, these are the four things that I'm going to talk about. So, firstly, you know why do we need to investigate floods? Um, then I'm going to talk about what Cloud to Street does, um, not as an advertisement for the company that I work for, but just as an example of what a research organization that wants to affect things on the ground uh, can do and, and kind of a template for how a research organization can work. Um, then the third thing is, how does our flood mapping work? And this will be a lot of uh, algorithmic uh, information. Um, this is specifically included because the audience of this uh, uh, webinar is uh, scientists, so this will be interesting. Uh, but I will try to do this pretty fast so that I can spend a lot of time. The last part, which is how are exactly flood maps used by the end users on the ground? And I, I believe that that is probably one of the most important components of what we do because you know, if the science that you produce is, uh, you know, not actually used by the users on the ground, then it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's not really kind of like public benefit. Um, and then uh, I will talk generally through the most part. So on the first three parts, I'll be pretty general because uh, mapping floods in the continent of Africa is, is not that different from mapping floods in the continent of Asia. But then in the in the last part, which is where the flood maps are used, I'm going to present kind of like three case studies of how flood maps in general and, and specifically cloud to streets flood maps have been used by African countries. And uh, then kind of like also talk about the gaps that still exist. And um, if you as a scientist are interested in uh, flood mapping, uh, how can you kind of like you know, what research can you do to kind of like make the world better for uh, people that are affected by flooding? So, uh, so let's start at the beginning. Why do we need to investigate floods? Um, so according to the World Bank, uh, floods affect more people and assets than all other disasters combined, which is a very startling um, realization. For most people, I certainly didn't know that when I first uh, worked at Club, I started working at Club the Street. Um, the Swiss Re Institute says that $80 billion of economic loss happened because of floods in the year 2021, uh, which is the GDP of the country of Ethiopia. So we lost kind of like the whole GDP of a country of Ethiopia sized chunk of money uh, because of just floods uh, all across the world. Um, the World Bank estimates that the economic activity at risk today is 5.3 trillion. So if there were like, you know, really, really bad flooding across the world, this is kind of like the, you know, top number of uh, damage. And then this is going to grow to 15 trillion in 2040 um, because of the fact that uh, people keep building things, you know, where floods happen. And, you know, floods have kind of like increased in, uh, frequency and the severity due to climate change. Um, to mitigate the risk to human lives and economic activity, we need both adaptation and uh, mitigation. 
So what, what is the difference between the two? So adaptation is spending money on before a flood happens. So increasing the flood defenses of a town, uh, you know, waterproofing roofs, uh, making sure that roads are, you know, not in low-lying areas. So this is the preparation that a town or a village or a country has to do before floods actually happen. And then mitigation is reducing the effects of a flood that has already happened. So rebuilding houses, rebuilding roads. Um, this typically needs a lot of capital. Mitigation needs a lot of capital because frequently you need to rebuild entire infrastructure, which has been damaged by floods. Now, governments and towns and certainly individuals do not usually have that kind of money just lying around, you know. Like if my house is damaged or completely broken by a flood, uh, I cannot usually just like, I usually don't just have the money to like rebuild it again. Um, so one of the most effective ways of mitigation is uh, through insurance. So how that is done is that the government or the town or the individual will pay a small premium every year and then they'll get, you know, pay, pay out when there's a flood and they'll use that capital to rebuild their houses or recover their economic livelihood uh, when there is a flood. Um, so like I said, adaptation is before the flood, mitigation is after the flood. One of the easiest ways to affect, you know, do mitigation is through insurance, but there's other ways. So, you know, when there is a large scale flooding, governments also have access to emergency funds that they can distribute to people. And so, you know, if you, if you can think of kind of like, you know, these funds being available for immediate use after a flood has, has happened. Um, so just to talk about uh, adaptation, we spend about 20 billion annually in the world on adaptation. And the United Nations Development Program uh, estimates that we need to spend 300 billion. So there's a 15x gap between the amount of money that the world spends on, adapt on flood adaptation and the amount that they need to spend on flood ad adaptation, especially in developing countries in, in Africa um, and also kind of like Central Asia. Uh, we estimate that um, the adaptation costs are five to 10 times higher than what you know, public adaptation finance actually allows. Uh, and then while the policies and planning are improving, the financing and implementation of these plans are still way behind where they need to. So like what I want to kind of like get through in this slide is that, um, you know, research is only one component and, you know, there's a policy and implementation part of this whole thing that actually is very important and that we usually, you know, don't really spend much, uh, much time on. So this is about adaptation. Uh, for mitigation, the 75% of flood losses are underinsured. So um, this is kind of like 40 billion plus annual losses every year. And you can see that in the chart on the right, most of the losses are uninsured, which is light blue rather than uh, insured. And Katrina, Sandy, and Harvey were three big US events. And you can see that during all those events, kind of like the amount of losses jumped uh, quite a bit. Um, in this talk, we are mostly not going to talk about insurance, even though it is kind of like a big part of the mitigation efforts across the world. And we are going to only focus on um, public sector, you know, like things that are available to every government, because I, if I start talking about insurance, I can probably talk for the next four hours, which no one wants. So we are going to focus on the non-insurance part of both mitigation and adaptation. Another interesting statistic uh, is that actually people move more into flood zones, which is counterintuitive. But you have to understand that in a lot of developing countries, like again, in Central, you know, Central Southeastern Asia and West Africa, um, they're very kind of like populated countries. And when you have new people wanting to build houses, a lot of the times the only space available is kind of like floodplains. 
Um, so new people are building new houses on floodplains, and so more and more people are being exposed to floods every every single year, which is also a cause for uh, great concern. Uh, and if you want to read more, there is uh, scan this QR code, and there is a paper that was published in Nature last year. Um, after almost eight years, uh, we know that like all three of these things are, are required to enable resilience local, locally and globally. So we also we need the necessary data and algorithms, uh, but we also need kind of like appropriate action on the ground, and we also need funding. So um, you know, data and algorithms, this is something that this audience can help with because all of you or most of you are scientists who have been trained to interpret data and algorithms. And if you're interested in that, please join the React Technical Committee uh, and the IADF Technical Committee. Uh, but the two other components are also very important. We need people on the ground who can take the appropriate action after the research component is over. And this action can be a lot of things. It can be kind of like training uh, people. It can be outreach to, to people who are vulnerable to floods. It can be distributing food aid or actively helping evacuation after a flood has happened. No matter what, you actually do need people on the ground to take action um, you know, as a necessary component of uh, enabling resilience. And then the people who are on the ground can only take the action if there's funding. So we do need kind of like, you know, global funding sources um, to kind of like enable resilience. And um, in Western countries, there usually is funding, but in countries in uh, West Africa uh, and even Central Africa, uh, there's kind of like, you know, not so much funding available um, to do these kind of like data outreach um, or, or you know, train people. So that's the first part of the presentation. So this is, I'm, I, I hopefully convinced you that we do need to investigate floods. We do need flood analytics and, and we do need to think more about uh, not just mapping floods, but what happens on the policy sites after, after we do that. So the next part is what does Flood the Street do? And like I said, um, I'm not trying to advertise the company that I work with, but only kind of trying to tell you, this is how a research organization a private research organization can affect change. So we use satellite and AI to detect uh, and track floods uh, anywhere on the earth in real time. Uh, we have worked with a lot of these people. Um, how it works is we ingest satellite imagery, uh, you know, from clouds. We create flood maps and run impact numbers and affected population infrastructure and croplands. And then actually we have a dashboard that gives you the alerts. And more importantly, we also send out these alerts in WhatsApp groups or through SMSs. And that is actually really important because people on the ground, for example, if you are a World Food Program volunteer uh, working in Malawi, you typically don't look at dashboards, but you do have a phone with WhatsApp. And if, if your phone says, hey, you know, like there's a very big flood happening nearby, then that is more actionable than you know you kind of like uh, looking having to look at the dashboard every day. And then like in the WhatsApp group, users are able able to upload their own data and observations, and then we can use that to kind of like you know validate what we're doing. So this is what we do. Uh, we also generate analytics for every phase of flooding. So this is you know similar to what I was talking about. So before the flood, you have to know the likelihood of flooding based on kind of like historical or modeled risk. So you know before the flood, I have to know what is the risk that I am going to be exposed to a flood. Then um, you know prepare early warnings or alerts about flood impact and severity ahead of an event. So this is kind of like alerting people before an event actually happens. Um, I don't want to kind of like give you the conclusions before I tell you what we do, but this is the part where I think we need the most active research because especially in, in countries like Africa where weather forecasting um, is not that great because there's not so many ground stations, this early warning component is both really important and really difficult. So if you're thinking about, hey, you know, like I need a topic for my PhD, what can I work on? This is a very interesting area. Uh, and if you want to know more, you can talk to me. Uh, okay, and then response. So like once there is flooding, uh, we need to have very good analytics of where the flooding is 
um, within 72 hours so that people on the ground can kind of like help in evacuation, distribute food supplies, um, and essentially like, you know, help in mitigating the impact of the flood. And then recovery is, you know, when uh, knowing whether the flood is receding or not. Um, so we do that all through our platform. So to prepare, we kind of like ingest data from 30 plus years and tell you how many times we have seen a particular place being flooded. Uh, which allows us to kind of like measure exposure. In Africa, we also uh, show the you know output of like a more established hydrologic flood model. So we'll tell you kind of like based on this hydrologic flood model, this is you know uh, how risky it is to be in this place. Um, so alert is again you know like we essentially just take the alerts that are published by different agencies and governments and tell you what is the possibility or what is the risk of a flood happening in the short term or, or medium term. Respond, this is actually something that we do very often, which is estimate the amount of flooding that has happened and then determine what is the impact of that flooding on population, on croplands, on roads. And these are very important kind of like analytics that you know governments and public organizations need to be able to you know estimate which area requires the most aid so that's usually the biggest question after a flood which is that we know that this general area has flooding but we have a limited stock of food and and supplies where do we usually need to direct it to to ensure that the most benefit is achieved and then recovery is kind of like, uh, you know, slow, but very important, which is to understand, uh, you know, if the flood is receding, the extent of the damage that is transient versus permanent, and, you know, like monitoring recovery in a region. This is like all the phases that Cloud Street does, and you can kind of like do yourself if you are a public organization through our, our dashboard. Okay, so... Hopefully that kind of like gives you a picture of the different types of responses to flooding uh, and what a private research organization or a public governmental organization or a non-governmental organization needs when there is a flood. So the next part is probably super interesting to the people in this room, which is um, how does our flood mapping work? So we leverage imagery from most public Earth observing satellites. So we have MODIS and VIRS, um, we have Landsat, we have Sentinel-1, and we have Sentinel-2. Uh, we have also used um, SMAP, uh, SMOS, GPM, and AMSER-2 in uh, some cases to understand when, when they're flooding. We also use task satellites so this is not something that you can use for monitoring because this is actually, you know, you need to like point the satellite at a place and tell the satellite, take a picture for me. Uh, and it's expensive, but it's very useful when you have kind of like a scenario where you, where you need very high resolution knowledge of where flooding is. And I'll show you a case study of that um, in, at the, uh, in the fourth part of the presentation. So then we uh, train deep learning algorithms. So we, uh, this is like our training set, essentially. It's global. Uh, we have a lot of training set. And what we do is we use our Dartmouth Flood Observatory, uh, which is you know, based out of the US, to identify historical cases of flooding. And then we validate those using Earth Engine. So here you can see um, on the right, there is like definitely water here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the blue area essentially is, is where water is. And then we generate, uh, we look at kind of like different layers and uh, that's how we use those layers to annotate uh, five by 12, five 12 by five 12 chip with uh, domain experts. And this is actually like really difficult. This is probably in, in terms of the science, the most difficult part of the whole thing. Uh, we all we always, or at least when I was a PhD student, I used to kind of like pay more attention to model building um, and like how complicated my models are or how like quote unquote advanced my models are. 
but it turns out that like labeling data is is way more difficult than than model building and to prove that i challenge you to tell me what is happening in these in these images so this like on the top left these like light blue things what do you think that is it's very hard to tell um or the the green in the middle on the top right you can kind of see a river through the clouds but is that really a river it's very hard to tell um the bottom middle image is probably my favorite because it looks like art but no it's actually like land but is there water in the light blue parts it's very hard to tell so essentially we work with a lot of domain experts to like look at a lot of these images and, and, and kind of like make a call on what is a flood and what is not a flood. And obviously we don't get it all right all the time, but hopefully we get most of it right and we, you know, and, and then we train an algorithm. The algorithm that we train is uh, is a unit. So um, I'm sure everyone, people who have um, taken any deep learning courses will be exposed to how our unit works. Uh, there is an encoder on the left and a decoder on the right. And the satellite image is actually not the only input layer to the unit. There's kind of like other layers that um, are you know, like important, but you know not that fun to talk about. Um, but essentially, the unit is trained on all these uh, SWATs, and it predicts a flood map um, then that we then kind of like uh, use. So yeah, if you have any questions about this, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so compared to kind of like existing baselines, our algorithms perform pretty well. So this is the uh, intersection over union score and uh, the baselines are kind of like listed below. They're kind of very well-known algorithms that, are, uh, that have been kind of like used for uh, water inundation detection for a long time. And I would like to point out that the MODIS one is special because our MODIS convolutional neural network actually um, is not a segmentation network, but it's a regression network. So it actually tells you the fraction of flooding inside each pixel. Uh, and, you know, like uh, very sharp eyed scientists among you might say that, like, if it's a regression network, then the IOU score is pretty meaningless. And yes, I agree. Um, it's just because the baseline also does IOU. That is the only reason why we calculate the IOU score. Um, the RMSC is probably a much better metric for the MODIS network, and um, you know we also have uh, we also have the RMSC, but I don't report it here. So this is how the Sentinel One CNN looks like. So you can see this our flood. You, so the first image is Sentinel-1, and the second is um, just the annotated flooding. So give you like one moment to look at it. The, the Sentinel-1 image is like a three-band composite of VB, VH, and then VB over VH. So those are the three bands that you're looking at. OK, Sentinel-2, similarly. So this, the second image right here is very interesting because you'll notice that cloud shadows actually look like water. And it's very important when you're building networks that these cloud shadows are not captured as flooding. And it takes a lot of kind of like specialized training and evaluation to make sure that you don't say that cloud shadows are, are water. So this is a big problem in optical images. Um, similarly with Landsat. And as you can imagine, I'm, you know, showing you like very good examples. There's also very bad examples where, you know, we don't do quite as well. Um, so there's always, you know, like if, if you want to um, get a research topic out of this, kind of like improving the accuracy or, you know, doing some interesting things around cloud detection is always uh, a good research topic. Okay, and then um, I can't sell this to you today because it's not, you know, like up. It's not available uh, in production. But we also fuse uh, flood maps with from direct observations with model products, and this is very important because, you know, especially for optical satellites, 
um, sometimes you don't have uh, an image, you know, like the Landsat images are only once every week. Um, Sentinel-1 is once every uh, 14 days at this point because Sentinel-1B tragically uh, is no longer with us. Um, but flooding can happen at any time. So what we do is we combine the observations that we get from satellites with land surface model outputs that are available every single day. And we try to infill the satellite record with uh, you know, land surface model outputs. And specifically the inputs that we use is global surface water, which is a, an interesting product that tells you uh, how often water has been seen in a location. Uh, we have the terrain routing, flow direction, flow accumulation. Uh, we have soil moisture at like different kind of like accumulation intervals. And we put all of this into the CNN um, and try to kind of like infill uh, between satellite observations. And you can kind of like see the two hurricanes. Um, it, for both of the hurricanes, the uh, satellite images were only taken on like maybe two days across the whole record. Uh, but we can kind of like infill using models to uh, see, you know, where there was inundation, even when the satellite image was not available. And this is actually something that, you know, technically I'm, I'm super um, impressed with uh, how it's performing right now. And um, if you want a specific presentation on this topic, which I think is, you know, like is really cool. Uh, we are actually presenting this at AGU and probably will present this at IGARS next year too. So um, you know, keep your eye open for that presentation. And this is just an RMSC of uh, the water categories for the fractional flooded area. And um, you know the RMSCs are, are pretty, pretty low considering how difficult it is to infill satellite observations. Okay, so hopefully that gave you kind of like a little bit of a glimpse into how our flood mapping works. Um, with the next kind of like 10 to 15 minutes, I will focus on how our flood maps used. And not just our flood maps, uh, but any flood maps. Uh, how are they used for, for decision making? Uh, but I'm going to focus on the use cases that we have observed because that's what I know the best. Uh, and then at the end, I will kind of like talk about some gaps that that's still in. Um, so this is kind of like a very uh, simple flood impact report that we generated in Malawi at the beginning of the year. Malawi is a country in South Southern Africa, uh, which kind of like gets flooded pretty often. So what you can see the flood report has is kind of like these flood alerts that tell you, you know, that there's kind of like severe inundation. And then because this report goes out to people who are usually GIS experts, we also tell them, hey, this observation was made using Sentinel-2 on this date so that they know, you know, how we know that there is a flood, essentially. And then we do flood alerts, cropland damages, and then, and then road floodings, and then settlements at risk. So these are kind of like some of the categories of alerts. And you can imagine that if you are part of a, uh, an organization responding to floods, that this kind of like directed specific information is super useful. Like we, we don't say that, okay, there is a flood in this area. We say that like there is a road flooded or there's cropland damage. We kind of like disaggregate the flood map into more specific impacts so that people on the ground can use it. And that is very important because as scientists, you know, me, you know, I, I care about the flood map, you know, I care about getting a very good flood map using a good algorithm. But actually people who are responding to floods need something more than that. They need these kind of like specific impact indicators. And that is something that I learned, you know, when I came to the industry. Uh, and this is why you kind of like have to involve users in your conversation and in your scientific process, because they will be able to tell you very early that like, you know, this is what we want. Uh, the next slide is kind of like a change in flooding. So this is between January 15th to February 15th, 2022. This shows the change in flooded area. Um, you know, so in some places it was flooded less, in some places it was flooded more. Um, and, you know, that's like one of the impacts. And then we also show you how many people and how many crops were, were impacted. Okay, so this kind of like gives you an example of a very generic report. Um, you know, we can repeat this a lot in different places. Um, you know, the only kind of like cost to this is, uh, you know, computational, like, you know, we have to like, 
spin up an AWS or GCP instance and, and then like, you know, do these computations. So that's the only cost. So the next thing is a, a, a place where we involve kind of like high resolution imagery. And this is something that cannot be automated as well. And this actually needs kind of like human analysts to look at an image. So um, this is a dam failure in Sudan. So on the top, you can see an outline of the country of Sudan. And then here at the, you can see the grayed out area is where there was a dam failure. This is right on the border of South Sudan and Sudan, um, two countries that are not friends with each other. So there's a lot of kind of like refugee movement across the border, and there was a refugee camp in this area. So during the week of September 4th, 15th in 2021, um, there was a reported flood. So here, the, the, the public imagery from Sentinel-2 was not high resolution enough. So we passed a planet scope image, which is at three meters. And we got a very good view of where the flood happens. We estimated the number of people affected, the number of or the cropland area affected, the roads affected. And then there was a refugee camp, uh, which was affected as well. And we reported that. So this, but the impacted refugee camp was a strong kind of like um, observations uh, because there's like not a lot of um, maps that show you where refugee camps are. Um, so you can clearly see from the planet scope imagery, you can actually see where the dam was breached here in the middle. And what happened is that the when the dam is breached, the flood water kind of like went into the community uh, in the south. And then this is the Kilo 4 refugee camp that was inundated. Uh, and then we estimated that 3120 people were affected. But this estimate is like not that accurate because the population data here is not that accurate. This is just to kind of like give an example of scale to the people using the maps, right? Um, it's, you know, it might be 6,000 or it might be 1,000. But like what this number shows you that it's probably not kind of like 10,000 or 100,000. So this is kind of like accurate at like a logarithmic scale, but you know, um, not like totally accurate. Uh, and then this is just kind of like some context. So, you know, we know that this area is flooded, but how often has this area been flooded in the past? And that we can kind of like estimate from the historical flood frequency using the public satellite archives that exist. And using those archives, we have we told the people on the ground that you know we should consider relocation of this camp because you know this area has been flooded kind of like you know a few times in the last kind of like 20 to 20 to 30 years. So again, this is a example where there was an analyst who looked at these images and you know, like found these kind of like dam failures or dike failures out and then, you know, like looked at the population impacted and looked at the historical flood frequency and then made a suggestion. So this is a very involved process. And we actually also you tasked planet here. So this is like not cheap as well. Um, and then, you know, where does the money to pay for this come from? It pays, it comes from the UN usually. Um, if 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 UN is not active in the country, there is you know usually um, not that much funding, which is one of the big problems with flood mitigation. Okay, so the third example is just like long term work that we have done in Congo. So um, in 2017, you know, like there were there was a huge flood in Congo, and actually that year I just found this headline yesterday. Uh, like three times as much as 25 times as many people affected or were killed in um, Africa during floods in 2017 than Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Harvey is kind of like this like tentpole event in uh, in the US, which is kind of like given as an example of how bad flooding can be. So just to give you an idea of like how many people are affected in this continent. But in Congo specifically, there were kind of like 5,000 people without food for three weeks. So the WFP office in the country contacted us and in, in, in 2018, we used satellite-based flood mapping uh, in, in Congo. And as you can see, like we um, 
sent out alerts on the left using using WhatsApp. And you know, because the predominant uh, language is French, the alerts were in French. This is like a part of localization. So you know, we usually operate you know our alerts in the in the language that is used in the country. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, the country director of uh, the World Food Program essentially told us that uh, 11,000 refugees had arrived in the location. Are they at flood risk? Right. So Congo, the Republic of Congo, and the Democratic Republic of Congo are like two countries again that are kind of like next to each other, but you know are not friends. So there's a lot of refugees from DRC that kind of like come into Congo. And then they are kind of like look, you know, they're put in shelters by the UNHCR. But you know, they usually don't consider, you know, factors like flood risk unless you tell them that you know they are at risk. So this is um something that happened in 2019. Um, you you don't see the rest of the WhatsApp conversation, but actually we found that they are at flood risk. And then we told the WFP people immediately that actually this the place where the refugee camp has been built is actually at a lot of risk. So the Ministry of Social Affairs in Congo actually relocated a lot of the refugees that we um, that that were kind of like in this uh, refugee camp because we told them that there was a risk involved. Um, and then ten months later, this whole camp was just flooded. So essentially 10 months after they were relocated, there was a large scale flooding, which actually affected the whole country, not just this region, but um, the refugee camp, if it was not relocated, relocated would have been completely flooded. So you can see kind of like the flooding here, this is kind of the place where the camp used to be. Um, and then, you know, like, after the big floods in 2019, the Republic of Congo also like, you know, could look at cropland affected uh, using kind of like satellite imagery uh, and monitor uh, recovery in cropland. And then, you know, in 2020, WFP found that they, you know, like were responding three months faster because of, not just because of Cloud the Street, but because of analytics provided to them by a variety of um, different places. Like they actually started putting more emphasis on flood analytics and started talking to more organizations and that resulted in their response being a lot faster. Um, and then in 2021, you can see that there was like a lot of, um, you can already see a lot of effect, um, you know, because of this investment in uh, flood resilience by the WFP in, in Congo. Um, yeah, so this is just like, you know, some of the quotes from our users on the ground. Um, again, like, I think it's very important to have direct connection with the users on the ground, because like I said, they will be able to tell you what they need better than pretty much anyone else. And one of the things that I really enjoy uh, about the work that we do is that we have direct connections to, to people on the ground. Um, so, and then the last example that I'll talk about is full country that exposure assessment in Ghana. Um, so essentially in, in 2020, there was a major dam overflow in Ghana, and then the disaster management organization, you know, requested kind of like situational reports, and we gave them kind of a summary of, um, you know, like the whole country. And as a result, there were kind of like cash vouchers, sanitation kits, and, and repairs were, you know, prioritized um, where there were the most affected households. So again, this is like an example where we have low resolution, but large area flood mapping across a whole country, which kind of like results in relative, you know, risk assessment and, and prioritization of where um, mitigation and adaptation measures can be like, you know, uh, really concentrated. Okay, so as an impact, you know, we have monitored a lot of countries, we have, you know, like helped a lot of countries you know, come to terms with increased flooding. Uh, and I still think that um, it is not enough. So like I said, there's kind of like these four phases of, uh, of, of like flood response. So prepare, alert, respond, and recover. And we need to have more research and more kind of like on the ground support on all of these four phases. So, um, you know, preparedness, which is like assessing vulnerability, 
uh, monitoring a country for flooding during the rainy season, early warning or alerts, which like I said, is probably one of the most, one of the least understood components of uh, flood response and something that like um, we would love kind of like more research in. Uh, emergency response, uh, recovery, and then resilience plan. So what are what are some of the gaps? So like I said, early, war early warning alerts is a big one. Um, another big one is just like cities, uh, very high density cities. So, you know, if you look at an optical image in a, you know, very densely populated city, um, very hard to tell what is flooded, what is not. If you look at a radar image over uh, very densely populated cities, there's like shadows, like building shadows. Um, and those building shadows, all the, you know, a lot of the times get confused for water. Um, and then also there's uh, roads, which usually have very low backscatter, and those roads appear as being flooded because you know they they always have a pretty low backscatter. So one of the ways in which a CNN or an, a physical thresholding algorithm recognizes water in radar imagery is like you know water has low backscatter, um, but because roads and deserts and all of these low backscatter regions you know are are, are confounding uh, for a water detection algorithm. So how can we use specifically kind of like expand and C-band radar for detecting water in a very highly populated city? This is something that no one's good at and, and we need like way more research in. Um, and then just, you know, what do you do when there's no satellite image, which kind of like I showed you a template for how we are trying to solve it by incorporating hydrologic models. But there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of like think about solving that and, and, and it is uh, super important. And um, then at the end, it's kind of like these resilience planning. So um, we can only look at floods in the past using satellite imagery. You know, obviously we, we cannot look at flooding in the future. So we can determine risk from looking in the past, but we know that that risk is changing because of climate change. And there's no good models that can kind of like tell you uh, how flooding is going to be more severe and going to be more frequent. Because climate change results in a lot of variability in temperatures. So it's not that, you know, like we are getting hotter every year. It's just that like the standard deviation of like the maximum and minimum temperature is increasing quite a bit. When there is warmer temperatures that results in more water vapor, more water vapor results in more rain, more rain results in flooding. So we know that, you know, at a very abstract level, that is what's happening, but there's no models that kind of like, you know, tell you exactly that this is the upper bound and the lower bound for the increase in flooding. So that kind of research will be very useful. Um, and yeah, I think those are kind of like, if, if you're interested in any of that, please feel free to uh, chat with me more or join React. And that is the end. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Subit. <laughs> An applause. So you see it and you hear it, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot. I think it's a really great overview about all the difficulties that you have and what you're doing actually in cloud to street. I think that's a very important work, as you were also mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, so thanks a lot for, for this really great overview. Uh, you also see because we have such a huge audience, uh, there's also immense, let me say, interest into this uh, topic. Uh, we had quite a lot ongoing in the chat, so a lot, a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, I um, can. I mean, I can just read it and, and try to answer as many as I can. Yeah, this is what I suggest. Or if you like, I can help you to read it and you can just think about how to answer as you like. So it's uh, up to you. Yeah, that sounds good. And then I will say that, like, if I don't get to your question, please feel free to kind of like, you know, tag me on Twitter and I'll, I'll respond. I'll respond there. Yeah, so I think we can just start. I think 10 minutes probably should be nice or probably before we start with the question, I don't know, is there a question that you like just to, you know, to pose it, uh, you know, to speak up in terms of speaking up and then we are reading them. I mean, or or if you like, as a as one who was posting it, you can also just speak up and 
tell us what you're what you're asking for. That's also great. Is there somebody who likes to speak up? So please feel invited <laughs> to do it, to open the video and uh, so that we and, and the microphone so that we hear your voice. Uh, I think they're it's, it's, a little bit he yeah. hesitant. <laughs> I think it's always easier yeah. to read it then. Okay, then we just start, right? Okay. So th the first question was, uh, do you work with star data as well? Yes, I mean, this is what you were showing, right? At the end. Yeah. So I think this was one of the first questions where you were just were showing also optical data, but now that's this makes clear. Mm -hmm. So then for the next, what other layers do you use as input for UNET ex except satellite images? Because I think there's something that you mentioned in your talk, uh, but we're not explaining. Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Again, I think like, you know, there's a lot of conference presentations that you can also find on YouTube that, that explain kind of like how the units work. But essentially we use a, a lot of different layers. We sometimes use the context from previous images. Um, we use um, like global surface water, which is a product that shows you how many times a particular location uh, has been inundated in the past, and you can kind of like estimate a frequency from that. Um, and then, you know, in, in, in the recent past, we have also used um, some of the states from hydrologic models, from land surface models. Uh, so flow accumulation, uh, flow direction, um, terrain, terrain routing, which is a hydrologic kind of like layer. Uh, and yeah, like a bunch of, of different things. But I, I hope that gives you a subset of some of the things that we looked at. The most important is the global surface water and then the satellite image itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, great, thanks. So then the next one, how do you address the clouds and the optical images? Because in tropical regions are mostly cloud covered. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, the the most that we do is make sure that we don't label cloud shadows as flood, and we don't um, try to kind of like guess what's under a cloud. I think we have tried to do that and found that it's very difficult. So, you know, there's, you know, we, we, we address it by, um, you know, making sure that we don't mistake a cloud or a cloud shadow for a flood. But otherwise, you know, we will in those tropical um, in those tropical regions with a lot of clouds, we use either radar or we use, I, mean, I think someone's like. Someone needs to mute themselves. Yeah. Okay. No, I think um, now it's better again. Breathe. <laughs> yeah. We either use radar or we try to use hydrologic models to kind of like infill between clouds when they happen, so that um, you know we know we know what's going on. But yeah, it's 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 really difficult. Mm -hmm. I, I I I when we have Sentinel One C, and uh, when we have uh, the NICSAR mission, I think it will be a lot better. Okay, great. So the next question, in case of radar images, how do you differentiate between in, intentional flat paddy fields versus flooded areas at the same time? Well, we look at kind of like, you know, historical precedent. Essentially, when you have paddy fields, they're, you know, inundated almost every year, whereas flooded areas, you know, don't happen every single year. So we can use that. Um, but otherwise, you know, like when we are looking at places with rice cultivation, um, you know, there's always a chance that there's some kind of like uh, confusion between flooded paddy fields and flooded areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the next question, what specificality do you use or do to exclude the cloud shadows in terms of modifying the net architecture? We don't modify the architecture. This is, as again, like a very good question. We don't modify the architecture. We actually um, like incorporate some sort of active learning. So we look at, you know, like very close Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 flood maps. And if they're very different from each other, like super different from each other, then that might be because of clouds. So then we, you know, re-annotate that and feed it back to the neural network. So, so that the model learns that, okay, this is like shadows. So essentially we, we do active learning and, 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 and you know, not kind of like 
traditional active learning, which is not, which doesn't have a human in the loop, but an active learning in the sense of we look at disagreements between the different networks that we have and then feed the images where we disagree the most back into the uh, back into the network mm -hmm. correctly. And that is that is pretty effective. Yeah, thanks. I think that's important. And then I see uh, there's one question in terms of where in Africa you're working mainly, but I think you were showing this different parts in Africa. So, um, right, right, probably. right. So we work, I, I can like tell you the countries. Uh, we work in both Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, we work in all of West Africa. So, and then we also work in Zimbabwe, in Malawi. Um, and then Congo and uh, like both Republic of Congo and Democratic Republic of Congo. Those, those are the mm -hmm. And then and the next question, have you trained your model in higher resolution satellite imagery like world view? No, because I mean, you look at the number of training examples we have from uh, like, I, I had the slide with the number of training swaps if you have to buy that amount of worldview imagery, you have to bankrupt. So what we do with worldview is we use just like, you know, NDWI thresholding algorithms. Um, and, and, you know, because worldview is, it, the sensor is so good and, and it's such a high resolution that that usually does work. So we have gotten images from worldview before and used MND, MNDWI based thresholding to do flat mapping. But we have never trained a CNN on it, but just because the training data would have to be so big and, and it would cost so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question Does the flat map created include permanent water bodies? Um, it does, but the <laughs> metrics don't. Mm -hmm. So, like the metrics that I showed you of IOU scores have our, our kind of like in different classes. And the classes that we use is the same as the global surface water product, which I mentioned we use as an input, which is, um, you know, never flooded, sometimes flooded and always water, right? So always water is the permanent water bodies. Um, sometimes flooded is places where we have seen a place flooded before and then never flooded is a place where you have never seen flooded. So we usually determine metrics on all three categories. And of course, the easiest is permanent water. And we always have IOU scores of like, you know, 0.96 in permanent water. And then the never flooded is always the hardest category. And our IOU scores are like 0.7 or, you know, there. Um, so yeah, we the flood map created does include permanent water bodies, but the impacts and the metrics don't include from red water bodies. Okay, the next question, why training the network? Have you made different classes such as urban flood, open area flood, agriculture area flood, as different land use flooded areas? We'll be giving different ref reflectance in the satellite images, especially in the case of SAR images. Yeah, great question. Another thing that I like, um, didn't get a chance to talk about because it would have taken like the, the whole time. But we we do divide it into biomes. Um, so they are kind of like the the international kind of like land use land cover classes that are that are accepted. And then the only thing that we add to the biomes is urban. So we take all the biomes and then urban. And that's how we kind of like make sure that we have enough variety in training and validation so that we know that we are doing well everywhere. Um, another interesting thing, which is super counterintuitive, is the biome in which we do the worst, you'll never be able to guess, is, is deserts. <laughs> Where you, you know, like, the problem is that it's very rare to see water in a desert, and, de mm -hmm. and deserts have really low reflectance and backscatter, you know, mm -hmm. so they are confused very, you know, with water. So mm -hmm. like deserts are, are a pretty challenging area for us. Yeah, I, I can imagine because of the very low signal that you get, mm -hmm. uh -huh. it's very dark. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, the next question, as you mentioned earlier, accurate inundation, early warning is challenging, but also highly critical for damage mitigation. 
Do you also use satellite imagery for inundation forecasting? If so, could you provide a bit more of insight about your work or about it? <laughs> yeah, that's a super good question. Um, we do use satellite imagery for forecasting. So the, the, the specific place where it's useful is that when you have a riverine flood, what is happening is that when the river started, there might be a lot of snow melt and a lot of rainfall that feeds the river and downstream the river floods, right? So you can imagine that if you can capture the increasing water at the source of the river, then you can forecast that there will be flooding later at the kind of like sink of the river, right? So that's the kind of like context in which we use imagery for uh, forecasting. Um, our forecasting algorithms are not very good. Like you know, just like honestly, like they're they're not very good, and we need a lot more research. One of the problems I will tell you, like the problem with forecasting, and it's that weather forecasting in Africa is not very good because weather forecasting needs a lot of high altitude balloons. It needs a lot of local stations. It needs kind of like different hierarchy of models. So you typically need a global model. Uh, more mesoscale model and a local model to do accurate kind of like you know forecasting of how much precipitation there's going to be and then you need a very good land surface model that can take those inputs and determine you know like how much soil moisture there's going to be or how much um, snow melt there's going to be and without that kind of like physical modeling infrastructure it's all almost impossible to do good inundation forecasting so the place that we have tried this is in South Sudan, where the flood is really slow moving. Um, and, and there we have seen that, you know, there's some good results, but then we tried it in Zimbabwe, which is really, um, you know, has very like different elevation and, and also there's like flash flooding and there we do really good. So I think one of the kind of like really interesting areas to work on if, if someone's interested is in kind of like improving these physical models in, in Africa because using remote sensing, right? Like, because, you know, a lot of these traditional models like don't use remote sensing at all, but, but there's an opportunity to use remote sensing to improve these models. And that will probably be really useful for uh, inundation forecasting. Yeah, thanks. So the next question is a little bit about accuracy and validation, how you validate your flat models or map, uh -huh, not models, uh -huh. sorry, but flat maps. <laughs> so there's a, there's a couple of things that we do. Uh, one of the things is just kind of like having a holdout validation set that we don't, you know, use to train the model. Um, and then we, we, kind of like match that with what the network predicts to see, to give you an IOU score. But then we also do indirect validation. So we will, um, for example, there's a company called Flood Tax that analyzes news sources and Twitter to estimate how many people are affected in a flood. Uh, and we use, uh, it's you know not very useful in rural areas, but in, in cities, like in, you know, we have done this in Lagos in Nigeria, for example, and there it's really good because Lagos is an English speaking country. And, um, uh, you know, like there's a lot of people, so there's a lot of tweets. So we can kind of like check for false positives and false negatives using uh, that kind of data. So we do that. Um, then in the US, there's kind of like a lot of kind of like United States you know, government provided kind of like flood data that we use. Um, and then finally, I know I didn't talk about insurance at all, but another thing that we use is insurance claims. So we look at kind of like maps of insurance claims and see if our flood model captures it or if our algorithm captures it. Okay, yeah, great. So the next question is, are you able to estimate the depths of the flood? Yeah, so we use the FWDET algorithm, uh, which was published by uh, I think the university, someone at the University of Texas Austin, uh, to estimate depth of the flood using satellite imagery. Um, long story short, it depends on the accuracy of the DEMs. In places like US and Western Europe, where you have very accurate DEMs, depths are pretty good. In places like Zimbabwe, where the DEMs are not that good, the depth is not that good. So another here's another area of research. 
can you use um, like LiDAR or other remote sensing, you know, like that is not dense, but sparse to improve DEMs uh, in, in, a, in a way that makes hydrographic sense, right? Like in a way that, you know, might not increase the absolute accuracy of the DEMs, but in, in improves the hydrographic accuracy of the DEMs. So the relative difference between sources and sinks, you know, uh, hydrologically. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, someone's interested. There's a whole research topic there. Okay, great, thanks. Um, the next question, how much computational resources, storage and speed do you use to train your model? Uh, we have some physical GPUs. Uh, I, um, I do not know what they are, but I could probably tell you later. Yeah, so we have like two Tesla GPUs that we use to to uh, train our model. And I mean, I'm not, I don't, I don't know the exact answers. But for example, I know that um, to train the Sentinel two model, um, it takes like three to four days. Um, so it's it's quite computationally expensive. <laughs> Can you still hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yes, I okay. can hear you. Okay, okay. I think our arena is just frozen. Um, all right, so I can just go to the next website. Um, is the output data freely available to African countries? And then the next question is related, which is does your data set can be accessed from the Club District website? Um, so to both of those questions, we have so as part of the nature paper that we published last year, we made the global flood database available freely, but it only goes until 2015. Um, data after that, uh, we provide to African government organizations and non-government organizations, but is not kind of like freely available. So there is a part of the data, which is the global flood database um, that was released as a supplement to the nature paper last year, that you can access. Um, there are some caveats to that. You know, it, it doesn't use CNNs, it uses MODIS, but you know, it is accessible. It's good for looking at long-term trends. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I've been just disconnected. Oh, <laughs> now, no now I'm back. I see you, you have answered already the three questions related actually to data sets. Uh, probably we can just go further on. Do you use uh, ArcGIS uh, or other software? No, we just use uh, QGIS. So ArcGIS is super expensive. QGIS is free. We uh, contribute a lot to open source software. So to like the stack specification and stuff like that. And we believe in kind of like improving open source software and using open source software. So that's what we use. We try to not use proprietary software. Where, where we, you know, the only place where we have to use proprietary software is if we need gamma for like, you know, radar processing or something like that. Like apart from that, we don't use proprietary software. Okay, the next question, do you have results from Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe to share? Um, I don't at this moment, um, but like, to be honest, like we don't really do that well in Zimbabwe um, because of the terrain and because of kind of like we don't really capture flood flash floods. Satellites don't really capture flash floods very well, right? Because you know, flash floods happen in like a few hours or, or, or a few minutes, and you know, satellite images at the most are every day. So it, it, wherever there is kind of like a lot of flash floods, we tend not to do very well. And Zimbabwe is um, one of those places. Okay, and then there was an, uh, a second question to this, um, to compute uh, the depths of floods. And yeah. It's a question, which methods or method are you using? Yeah, I just like posted the name of the algorithm on the chat. That's that's what- Okay, means. perfect, great. Okay, and then there's remaining two questions. <laughs> Is there an interest in using crowdsourced imagery, for example, photo posted to Twitter during flood events to understand on the ground real-time flooding or to use for validation? 
Yes, we do that. So we do that in two ways. One is using the WhatsApp groups that I like told you about. So you know, people on the ground actually like post their images on the WhatsApp group, and we use that to understand you know like whether there's a false positive. So you know, places where we said that there is flooding and there's actually no flooding, and false negatives. So places where we said that there is no flooding, but actually there is a flood. That's the first way. And then the second way is, like I said, using this company called Flood Tags, which is also kind of like a research company. Um, and what they do is they have an algorithm that analyzes real-time Twitter and news data to understand where there is flooding. And we use those reports both as kind of like validation and in the future, we want to use them as inputs to our CNN as well. In in some sort of like, if you're if you're um, aware of uh, um, refiner networks, like that's that's how we want to use uh, crowdsourced data. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last question: To measure flood severity, do you have insight what data should we use beside flood deaths and flood extent? Um, yeah, so usually a lot of governments, and this is not um, completely uh, standardized, but a lot of governments will publish their own data. Um, you can use that to estimate severity. And this is really useful in uh, countries like Colombia, where the data that like governments produce is actually like pretty good. Um, just remember that like governmental data always has biases. So for example, if you are the Republic of Congo, you might not want to show that flooding in your southern border is causing refugees. So you might like not publish that. If you are um, Ukraine, you know, your sources of data might not be that good because there's kind of like Russian interference. So just remember that like all, every governmental data in developing countries specifically always has political biases and try to account for that when you're doing your validation. Um, but otherwise it's, it's a good way to validate your algorithms. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and there was already a question about how to contact you and you see it, Subit was already putting it again on the street so that you can contact him. This is email and also Twitter over Twitter. So both are possible uh, contact details. Yes, I think now we are at the end. <laughs> I would like again to thank first the author <laughs> or the speaker really here to, uh, to give us these insights and also to answering all these huge questions or a lot of questions. And I would like really to ask of the audience to be so active, right, in asking questions. I think that's very important. Thank you very much for everybody. So, and I wish you really, wherever you are, a good day still, a good morning, or even a good evening. So thank you. Thank you very much. And hopefully we see us next time to the next webinar, which will come soon. And uh, the topic will be about the Himalaya Karakorum region and the impact uh, that this region has through climate change uh, in terms of glacier melt uh, and other uh, extreme events, let me say. Okay, yeah, thank you again and uh, hopefully see you soon and stay healthy. Bye.